Royals Weekly. I am your host, Marcus Mead, and joining me as always, a sock puppet who somehow became a real boy, my brother Mike. Who is writing this hacky garbage? These garbage jokes. Really haven't seen your best effort. Are you the Royals offense what? currently? Actually, actually, is... what's happening is I'm trying a real avant-garde kind of a thing, like a type of comedy that is <laughs> oh. like a little out of left field, like a Tim Robinson yeah. kind of thing. Uh-huh. You wouldn't so just get say it. You wouldn't bad. get it. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> the kind of comedy saying. that you don't laugh at, you just you think about and still hate. So. <laughs> you just think to yourself, okay, that's funny. <laughs> no, but that's no not what I was thinking. <laughs> oh, no, no. You were thinking, hey. Uh, I was you thinking, know. Oh, we can't come up with anything better than that. Jeez. No, no, no <laughs> Pinocchio-based humor moving forward. I got it. Okay, no. I got it. Uh, actually, humor I wrote that never land. intentionally okay. <laughs> to be bad so we could make jokes about it afterwards. Ah. That's how next level I am. That's how uh-huh. next level I am. So... In your face. Uh, you're going to miss me when I'm gone next week. And so, yeah, yeah, you're right in this stuff. On this week's episode, we'll review another winning week from the Royals, discuss the impact uh, of defense this the, on this team, as uh, so sort of what their defense is doing for them this year, and then preview this week's games. Yes, you just saw the programming note I was going to announce here. I will not be here next week. And so Mike gets to, figure, gets to once again learn experience how difficult producing this podcast is when you actually have to do something for it, okay? We are going to be Easy. joined, uh, I think, by the wonderful Josh Kaiser of One Royal Way. My, he and Mike will uh, will put out the episode next week while I am on vacation in Outer Banks, North Carolina. Uh, so, yes, I will enjoy that. We will be I will be here for the following um, weeks, not next week. Midweek but, episode. Not the one to, yeah, midweek episode, all those. I'm going to be here for those. But uh, for our uh, Monday episodes, Mike and Josh will take over for next week. I also want to remind you, and this is hugely important because we're not getting as many of these lately. You ha- you need to like and comment on like our episodes, especially on YouTube and stuff like that. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube account. Make sure you're subscribed to our Substack, royalsweekly.substack.com. It's only five bucks a month, but you, I think I've put out at least two articles every single week that we've been hosting it. And plus the midweek episode that you get if you subscribe to the Substack, a lot of cool stuff, but make sure you're liking and subscribing all that content because that moves us up the algorithm, gets more people listening to us. And don't you want to help out your favorite podcasters? Smile, smile big for the camera, Mike. Smile okay, big. You, you look wild. You look like a sock puppet who's come to life with that one. <laughs> Real creepy. Royals Weekly is brought to you by All in Physical Therapy. You already know that All in Physical Therapy helped turn our mother into a world-class decathlete. What's above a decathlete? She's even above that. An octathlete? Pentathlete? Pentathlete? I don't no, know. Pent would be I five. I don't know. I don't even know what <laughs> any of this is. But what do you know, or what you don't know, is that mom loved her experience there because of the personal attention that she got from Tommy and the staff at All In. They guarantee a personalized one-on-one experience to suit the needs of patients recovering from total joint surgeries, sports surgeries, or any kind of injury or pain. Even the pain Mark feels, realizing he chooses to keep that mustache. Yes, I do. Yes, I love Mm. it. All in Physical Therapy is owned and operated by Tommy Freevert with locations in Blue Springs and Lee Summit. But most importantly, they're in-network for nearly all insurance providers. I think in-network will probably be a slang phrase for someone doing well in the future. Like, oh, he is so in-network. I can so see that. That's going to be a thing. I get, that's mm-hmm. going to be a thing. I think if we were to adopt that. If you're a high school athlete recovering from an injury or someone bouncing back with a brand new hip or knee, check out the best physical therapy in the KC Metro at allin-pt.com. That's A-L-L-I-N-PT.com. Or give them a call at 816-427-5300. That's 816-427-5300. We do actually have roster news this week, some unfortunate roster news, but it also is, it has a little bit of a silver lining to it, I think. Alec Marsh was put on the 15-day injured list with a right elbow contusion after taking a comebacker, a line drive that came right back and hit him basically right in the forearm slash elbow area. And so that he got put on the 15-day injured list with a right elbow contusion. As a result of that, it has been announced that Jonathan Bolin will be brought up to the major leagues for tomorrow, this is Monday's, start to replace him while he's on the injured list. Mike, what are your thoughts on Alec Marsh to the 15 day IL and getting to see Jonathan Bolin come up and replace him? Well, I still think that this is probably the best that we could hope for. If you were watching that game, I mean, I was immediately like, "Uh Oh, that's going to be, I, you immediately thought, I hope nothing is broken. That's how hard that ball got hit back at him. Yeah. I Um, looked at, I looked it up. It was almost 95 miles an hour off the bat, a line drive right back into his arm. So (laughs) And right into his throwing arm. So, yeah, we were all just really happy to hear that nothing was broken. Yes, it was a bad bruise and enough to make him miss two or three starts. But uh, you're excited for Jonathan Bolin and you're excited that it wasn't worse for Marsh. That's how I'm feeling right now anyway. 
Boland's been very good in AAA. You know, he had that Tommy John surgery a couple of years ago, was kind of a, you might consider last year kind of a reclamation year. And then this year, he's really shown the Jonathan Boland that he could be before that. Now it's with slightly different pitches and slightly a slightly different way of pitching than what Boland was doing before the injury. But I think he's done great. And I'm really excited to see him against a good Toronto lineup. Yeah, he's going to he's gonna be tested. There's no doubt about that. That Toronto lineup is good. Some of them were struggling a little bit when they came to Kansas City, but also the weather when they were here was awful. And so, you know, not real conducive to offense. Uh, Bolin has a 2.57 ERA in 21 innings pitched uh, down in AAA with a 1.10 whip, 21 strikeouts and five walks. There's nothing you dislike about that line. That line is real, real good. And he has looked real, really good in AAA. The slider looks sharp. The fastball looks like it's getting enough downward movement at times. The one thing that changed about him with that Tommy John, he was a big time ground ball pitcher before that Tommy John. When he came back to it, he really hasn't been much of a ground ball pitcher. He's not like an insane fly ball pitcher or anything like that, but he's not generating a ton of ground balls. He's not leaning on a heavy sinker or anything like that. And so we'll see what it's like for him in Major League Baseball. I do love a home run preventer, and he's not exactly that anymore. Uh, but he can get swing and miss. He can, you know, go out there and limit walks, and that's going to be a huge part of it for him. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I was like, oh, thank God, when I saw it was only a 15 day IL stay. Uh, we mentioned last week that, you know, that I've only seen two players ever hit in that area. He's one of them, and then Mark Pryor, and it really messed up Mark Pryor's career. And it looks like that won't be the case for for Alec Marsh. It looks like it'll just be a a little bit of time down, and then he comes back and hopefully gets right back on the successful track he was on. And so. You know, having a guy like Bolin is great for for that depth, feeling more confident that you're going to bring a guy in who can actually give you a competent start. So hopefully that's what he does against a really good Blue Jays lineup. One thing to visit with this, because uh, David Lesky brought it up today on Twitter, I believe, um, that I thought was really interesting and I hadn't really thought about it, is think about what this says about what the organization thinks of Daniel Lynch right now. And that Lynch was given every opportunity to be the next guy up or to be the guy in the rotation and then every opportunity to be the next guy up. And he just has not grasped those opportunities. Jonathan Bolin has, and Jonathan Bolin certainly wasn't given the opportunities that Daniel Lynch has been given. So, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there who are still hanging on to a Lynch as a key piece of our rotation at some point, but more and more, it looks like, less likely that we'll see that in the future. And, you know, I don't want this to come off as like petty because that's not what it's meant to be or anything like that. But we talked about this. We ta we've talked about it for two years now, right? If you, this is 2024 major league baseball. If you don't make your arsenal literally as good as it could possibly be, you're never going to make it. And Daniel Lynch and everything he said and everything he's done has not given any indication that he's out there to make his pitches better all the time. And you're seeing the results of that right now. Like, does he have the frame and the arm talent and all the sort of stuff that would make a successful pitcher? Absolutely. What doesn't he have? The dedication to make his pitches. And I'm not saying it's like he's not a dedicated athlete. I'm just saying his focus is not in the right areas. He needs to dedicate his time, attention, and energy to making his pitches better. And no indication that we ever get from him is that he's doing that. And this is the result. Of, this is what you see. Guys passing him up. Alec Marsh has passed him up. Jonathan Bolin has passed him up. You know. A bunch of guys have passed him up. You might say, I mean, you could argue Veneciano has too. I mean, you could, you could definitely make that argument. Right. And so, you know, that's going to be the case. Is the talent still in there? Uh, absolutely. If he goes out this season or in the off season and he's like, I need a new arsenal and I need to be better than this one. And he makes it happen. He'll have another chance. But for now, there's nothing really to speak of in terms of Daniel Lynch's viability as a major league starter. Another, because of the Alec uh, Marsh injury, another Royals pitching prospect got brought up this week, a reliever. Will Klein made his major league debut today, being called up and got to pitch today against the um, Tigers. Mike, what are your thoughts on seeing Will Klein come to the major leagues and what he did today uh, in the game? It was, it was really cool to see. You know, he got an inning today, recorded two strikeouts, got three up, three down. Fantastic stuff from Will Klein. And it really was... So I had to go back because I didn't get to watch the full game today. I watched like four innings and then I had to go do something. I came back and I caught like the sixth and I was like, okay. But then I saw as I was filling out the outline that Klein got to pitch today. So I actually had to pull up the game again, fast forward all the way to the eighth inning so I could watch uh, Will Klein pitch. And it was the full Will Klein experience kind of, you know, 
because of this, the longer he stays in Major League Baseball, the more teams will adjust to him when he comes in and the less they will swing. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> and so it was great. And he, you saw the electric breaking ball, especially. Uh, you saw the great fastball. He got the strikeout with the fastball up in that uh, second at bat, I think. Um, and then he got one looking, I think was it, I think it was looking on a breaking ball, wasn't it? That last I don't strikeout. Remember. I can't remember, but um, I was half that's asleep what he when the game was going on today. Just absolutely electric fastball, and I, I would call it a curveball, but I, maybe people call it he a has slider. Both. I don't know. Uh, so I looked. I saw the curveball mostly today. I think, but um, I, just devastating breaking. I mean, devastating. It's it's really really good stuff. But as you'll notice, a lot of that stuff wasn't all that close to the zone, and guys were still swinging at it. That won't continue forever, and so. Uh, I think Will Klein can be great, and maybe you were right, maybe or maybe you're right, in that he can be that strikeout answer in the bullpen. I'm just real skeptical. I want to see it over a long period of time. Uh, our good friend Alex Duvall brought up leaving him in Major League Baseball because when Bolin comes up, somebody's got to go down. And the question will be, is it going to be Will Klein or is it going to be somebody else? Is it going to be Tyler Duffy? Is it going to be somebody else? I don't know. Yeah, here's the issue. Duffy would have to be DFA'd. Nick oh, Anderson. Yeah, he's a Nick Anderson can be taken down. Can, he has options, uh, but you know they'd have to be creative. And Hill Zerpa could be sent down if they want to do that. Blanco you know, could probably be sent down. You know, it just depends on what they. No, they can't. Then they would have too many pitchers, right? and so oh, damn. because right now, right now they have a surplus, one extra bullpen guy, and one fewer starter because Bolin hasn't been brought up yet, but Will Klein was. And nobody was sent down other than you know. So the bullpen has nine pitchers now, and the or uh, how many? My math is garbage. You're allowed to have 13, right? Mm -hmm. The bullpen has nine. The rotation has four, right? And so they're not going to stick with that. That's going to have to be eight and five when Bowen comes up. Uh, and so we'll see what the math is there. We'll see if Klein gets to stay up. I think he should stay up. I think sending Anderson down wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, the thing that excites me about Klein is, and I have to thank Josh Kaiser for mentioning this and, and referencing it on Twitter the other day, because I didn't realize it because I don't watch every client client outing in triple a, but he has added a cutter apparently. And mm. I think that the fact that he might have a four pitch mix four seam fastball slider curveball cutter would mean the world to him, right? Because when he was just fastball curveball and the fastball was like 99, hundred, it had to be 99, hundred and it had to be a really effective 99, hundred, right? Because we've seen Carlos Hernandez go out with 99, hundred and it's just not that effective. Kleins would have to be really good 99, 100, and it would have to stay up there, right? Like if he has four pitches, including a cutter that can go, what, 95 to 97, that'd be amazing if he can sort of come out with a mix like that and can find a way to throw strikes. And plus it gets easier to throw strikes when you can be more deceptive to hitters. You, you know, you can live in the zone more. You can sort of, you know, have more confidence that the pitches you throw in the strike zone won't get hit. And so love to what we saw from Klein today. Hope we get to see that full four pitch mix. And I hope he does stay up on the field. The Royals went four and three last week, which brings their overall record to 17 and 12 second in the AL central. They're, they're kind of stuck in that second in the AL central mode right now. Mike, how do you feel things went on the field after they got three of four from the blue Jays to win a series against a good team and then lost two of three to the tigers on the road? Yeah, that seems uneven to me because I feel like even though their record may not show it, Toronto's a better team. Now, they've, they've got some issues in their starting rotation, and that's what lets you compete with a team like Toronto. But that was a really good series win, and then it just felt like the Tigers series wasn't quite what we wanted. You know, Waka was, for the first time really this year, not very good today. He was very leaving. I mean, he left so many pitches, at least in the four innings or whatever I saw, just right in the middle of the plate. He could not stay out of the middle of the plate for some reason. And that's not Michael Walker. That's not the Michael Walker we've seen. So, um, yeah, a little uneven. You don't like dropping those two to the Tigers. The offense is still concerning from this week. You know, we had a game where we scored eight. Most of that at the end of the game. You know, you have two two games that you win three to two you know, against Toronto, you win a game two to one against Toronto. We're just not scoring consistently. And there's just so many guys in the lineup right now that aren't hitting. Like, I think I sent you a text today. It was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that real quick because I wanted to bring it up at some point. Um, here we go. Everyone not named Michael Garcia, Bobby Witt Jr. and Salvador Perez in today's lineup. Three for 20, 
no extra base hits, one walk and seven strikeouts. And that's just really been the, the story. I mean, those three have hit this week and outside that nothing, zero. And, and that's so, been the, the last couple of weeks or two or three weeks. It's been three guys hitting six guys, not. And th- sometimes those three guys rotate a little bit. Like for a while it was Vinny and then Michael got back, to, back on it and that sort of thing. But you know, it's three guys hitting and six guys, not most of the time, the last few weeks. Yeah. And we can't, and that's, that's not something we can consistently do and, and not win because there is going to be regression from the starting rotation. And we've started to see some, that some. Yeah. I keep wanting that definitive week where the Royals come out and just dominate good teams. But I think I have to sort of remind myself that this team isn't that good. They're not good enough to go out and just pound the Jays and then come out and just easily take a series from the Tigers or, you know, they ran in, it was a weird sequencing facing the Tigers. So they beat Reese Olsen in that first game, right? But really they beat the Tigers bullpen. The second game comes and who, who, who started yesterday? It was Singer. It was Singer versus Casey Mize, right? And they end up losing that game, which was blown by the bullpen. Well, now it's 1-1 and they're facing Tariq Skubal. And it's like, well, this series is a loss, like, because they can't beat Scooble unless maybe they got Reagan's going or something like that. And so uh, they could have, if Waka had been like his best, uh, the best version of himself, he would have competed with Scooble today just because the Tigers lineup is not very good. But what ended up happening is Waka was pretty bad today. The Royals ended up losing 4-1. And so they're not that team that can go out and just be dominant for a week. They're a slightly maybe above 500 team. That's where they are right now. Mike, for that slightly above a 500 team, who was your strong performer this week? Michael Garcia, as you mentioned, I took the low hanging fruit for this one. Um, 10 for 26. He had a home run, a double, seven RBI, three walks to two strikeouts. And he just seems to be a little bit more selective, although he's being very aggressive in that first plate appearance. If you've noticed that at all, he's being very aggressive in that first plate appearance. But overall, he is having better at bats. He's not popping the damn ball up so much to right field. That was killing him. And so good to see him hitting more line drives and then using his wheels when he's on base has been big for him as well. So uh, he's he was the genesis of that only run today. He's just been a real positive force there at the top of the lineup again this week and last really at the end of last week, too. So good to see him going again and need it to continue moving moving forward. Yeah, it just it just dawns on me right now that we just really have not seen like this lineup clicking on all cylinders at all yet this year, right? And getting Markel Garcia back to the leadoff spot helps or being productive there helps because you know him, Bobby, Vinny, Salvi, like having those four grooving is a big part of ha- having a successful lineup and you know, so he's one more piece and they boy, you can tell the difference when he's on and when he's not for this lineup. I'm talking about a guy who had kind of a sneaky good week. I feel like people aren't thinking about him because he's had a really bad season overall offensively. But Kyle Isbell had a really good week last week. He went five for 17 with one double, one triple, one home run, two RBIs, one walk, and only one strikeout. And, you know, Isbell's not a big walker, but if he can keep an even number of walks and strikeouts, he's got a really good chance to be productive offensively. Looked a little bit better at the plate, but also just got some better outcomes, a little bit more good fortune at the plate this week than he's had in the last few weeks. Plus, and this is something you're always going to get from Kyle Isbell, he made an absolute amazing catch in that final game of the Blue Jays series that kind of saved them the game. It was like a game-saving catch. One of the final innings that there was going to be that was going to be played. If you that recall, we knew it was going to be played. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you recall, it was raining that whole last game of the Blue Jays series, and everybody knew the game was going to get was going to get ended after like basically five innings when the game became official. In something like I want to say the fourth or the fifth. Somebody leading off an inning hits a ball directly to dead center that they crushed off Reagan's. They hit it really, really hard. Now, and caveat Isbell, here, it, it wasn't going to leave because no ball was going to leave. leave that no day. No ball was leaving that day. The weather was <laughs> not good at all. And so Isbell like gets a great jump on it. You know, he starts overrunning it a little bit, but you could tell it was like the wind was really blowing too. So it might have just been blown back off course. Tracks this ball amazingly, dives, makes an amazing diving catch. And as a result, they don't got a guy on second with nobody out uh, with a good chance to tie that game because the Royals were only up one at that point. And so Kyle is with an amazing game. So he gives him and catch gets, gives you the great defense all the time, but he gave them something with the bat this week too. Hopefully he can continue to build on that and get his offensive numbers back to respectable. Cause having a guy at the bottom of the lineup just does so much 
for this lineup if they can say, hey, Isbell, you get on base at nine, and then it'll be Garcia, Witt Jr., Vinny Pasquantino right behind you. That's huge for them. Not everybody was as hot as Garcia and Isbell this week. Mike, who was your week performer for the week? I got We got to talk about Nelson Velasquez because you and I were big proponents of him making the 26 man out of spring training. Some other people were calling for him to be sent to Omaha and have Prado take that spot. I don't know that Prado taking that spot was ever really a good idea. He hasn't really shown much in AAA yet this year. And Nelson Velasquez started off the year doing very well. But you could kind of tell it, it was from a different approach. He wasn't doing he wasn't doing anything like he was doing last year. He was walking more. He was hitting some breaking stuff to the opposite field a little bit more. Now he's doing nothing. He was zero for 16 with one walk and five strikeouts this week. So I had to go dig a little bit into the numbers. And really the difference between last year and this year, if you go look at it, it is exactly that. He's not doing the damage on fastballs that he did last year. He's not. He's got a decent batting average on four seam fastballs, but the slugging percentage is way down, and the expected batting average is actually much lower than the batting average itself for four seam fastballs against him. And so, but he's still doing the same. He's still struggling quite a bit with breaking pitches, and so they're throwing him a bunch of breaking stuff, and he's not doing damage on it. And now they're also later in, in counts, you know, he's got two strikes. They're throwing him fastballs. And rather than mashing them like he was last year, he's fouling them off. And it's so frustrating because he's not providing any value to that lineup. And you know, he doesn't give anything defensively. So yeah, really need him to get back on track. He can be a guy who's a fastball killer. Moise Salou made a friggin' career out of it. So did Nelson Cruz. Get So did Nelson Cruz. Just get back to what you do best. Nelson Velasquez, start mashing fastballs. And I feel like this is the direct result of attempting to get better hitting those breaking balls is that he said, okay, I'm going to sort of sacrifice my timing here, not be on top of these fastballs and wait so that if it's a breaking ball, I can hit it the other way. The problem with that is when you get fastballs, now you're not on top of them, right? Last year, what the approach was for him was essentially don't swing at breaking balls until I absolutely have to wait till I get a fastball, mash it, right? Like it was a very simple kind of approach. Now, though, it seems like he's trying to mix in this notion of like, no, I want to be able to hit those breaking balls when they throw them because they're going to throw them a lot more this year, which they are. Um, but it might be the best idea for him to sort of play to hit fastballs, right? Play to get fastballs and hit them, right? That might be the case. Now, it also is just the case that there's something up with his timing or his swing, and it's just not quite happening when he does get those fastballs. We know that that's the case. But... I'm still of the mind that you need to wait and let Nelson Velasquez get into his groove because when he is, he's a super productive hitter. He's a big time power threat and you want him in the middle of your lineup. My week performer for this week, we've already brought up Mike and that was Michael Waka. It wasn't just the one bad start. He hasn't been really great the whole week. And so he went 10 innings this week because he got two starts, 17 hits. He gave up in those 10 innings, 17. That's not good uh, because he's probably leaving the ball in the middle of the plate too much. Six earned runs, two home runs given up three walks, two hit by pitches. So he gave up five free first bases this week and then seven strikeouts for Michael Waka. Always going to be kind of a case that he's going to get decent strikeout numbers with that great changeup. Waka is a dude who, you know, occasionally you'll have a bad stretch. I'm not too worried about it. I'm just like, uh, that's one of the reasons that they had, did not uh, grab more wins this week is Michael Waka. Michael Waka went out and put up a couple of not great starts from them. If, and part of the problem is Waka went up against the number one for the, for Detroit today. I don't know if he went up against, I don't know who he went up against for uh, the Blue Jays, but uh, I can't remember. But can't remember either. going up against Terry Scooble, he's going to have to be perfect. And Scooble just out, out dueled him today very easily. Like, and so, because Waka was not perfect. Hopefully he can find a way to find that command on that changeup, quit leaving so many of them right down Broadway, and uh, get back to the way he was uh, looking earlier in the season. Not too worried about it. It's ups and downs, as it always is for veteran pitchers. But I think ultimately he'll he'll get back to his uh his good form. Yeah, and I'm I'm not worried about it either. I think it's location for him. I'd be much more worried if I felt like the stuff was not as good. That would worry me a little bit more with his age, especially. But the location stuff, the changeup is a feel pitch, and so you're not going to feel it every day. You know, it's not going to be something that you have a great grasp on every single day, all the time. Michael Walker is a changeup pitcher because he has that feel more often than than most but there are still going to be days when he doesn't locate that pitch tremendously. And, and that's been the case this week. Yeah. 
Mike, with all this taken into account, long seven-day week, seven games, four and three, that's pretty good. That's not great. What is your theme for this week? My theme comes from the good people of Royals Weekly fandom. If you have never sat down and listened to the entire album Running on Empty by Jackson Brown, you need to do it. Because it's, need to do it. in our estimation, one of the finest albums of all time ever written, especially. The writing is unbelievable. Jackson Brown, a great songwriter. But there's a song on that album called The Road. And one of the refrains, I don't think it's really the, I don't know if it's the part of the chorus or what. It's basically the chorus, yeah. Um, It it goes, it's just another town along the road. Great song. I'm going to go listen to that after this, actually. (laughs) Um, Now now it's in there. I I used to know how to play that on piano. I can't Uh, remember that. uh, But anyway, it's just another town along the road. If you look at the Royals record right now, they are under 500 in games on the road, and they're pretty high over 500 in games at home. And so I worry, and you also may notice that they've played a lot more at home than they have on the road so far. And so I'm just thinking we've got to be able to get that offense more consistent when we're on the road. I don't know if it's finding some good cooking or getting better sleep or how we're preparing or just the teams we've played on the road so far, but we've got to get better on, on the road as we, especially as we go and face a tough Toronto team in Canada this weekend or this week. Canada is not home for everybody who's, who's listening to yeah. this. That is not their home, home uh, stadium. Uh, yeah. That, mine, mine is, my theme is basically about the offense as well. And it comes from a movie that you and I both find funny. I think I, I find it funny. Uh, it's called <laughs> beer league. It's a, it's, it's a, a Artie Lang movie. Uh, it, is it Artie Lang? Is that his real last yeah, name? Yeah, Artie Lang okay. and uh, Ralph Macchio is in it. Ralph Macchio <laughs> is in it. Yeah. So is Joe Latuglio. Who, and this is a line yeah. said in a scene that he's in, uh, said to him by Artie Lang. So uh, it's about a beer league softball team and a guy who takes it way too seriously. Um, and there's a guy on the team named Dave, played by Joe Latuglio, who is terrible at softball. And he's up swinging and he's like taking batting practice and he just keeps missing, swinging and missing at slow pitch softball. And Artie Lang's just standing there and he goes, you know, Dave, you might be a lefty. Because <laughs> he's swinging right-handed, right? Uh, and it just kills me every time. And I keep thinking this when I'm watching some of these guys just flail at pitches like fastballs right down Broadway. Hampson, you, you might be a lefty. You might be a lefty. Are we I sure Garrett Hampson exactly. isn't left-handed? Are we sure, Are we sure? he's not left-handed? And so <laughs> that's what just what's been on my mind this week. Hampson, you might be a lefty. Royals Weekly is brought to you by Eric Oksher of West USA Realty. Phoenix has all of our favorite things, year-round golf, year-round baseball, and Eric Oksher of West USA Realty. Whether you want to buy your dream retirement home or just stay a while and catch spring training, Eric can help you find the perfect house. We've known him for 30 years and trust him far more than we even trust each other. Mark called in an anonymous tip to the FBI that I was breaking bad if you catch my drift. The agents showed up at my house. They were not gentle. Eric does long-term rentals for the Snowbird crowd and home sales and purchases for those who want to stay a while longer. Are you a baseball player or parent who needs a place in the Phoenix area? Eric will find you the perfect spot fast. Want to spend your day shanking golf balls into the great beyond? Eric knows the golf scene like Mike knows the rigors of a full body cavity search. Yuck. Find Eric online at ericoxer.com if you can figure out how to spell his name. It's E-R-I-C-K-A-U-X-I-E-R.com. Or just shoot him a text at 480-383-9745. That's 480-383-9745. Even if you're just curious about what he can do for you, he's 100% no pressure. One of the best people we know. And he'd never try to get a sibling busted by the feds. Probably not. We've spoken about the offense, the rotation, the bullpen, and each of those units have had their ups and downs this season. But one constant that might explain the early success of the Royals better than any other factor is the defense. The Royals led all of Major League Baseball in with 25 defensive runs saved coming into today, which is Sunday, April 28th. And it's clear that their pitching staff has benefited from a rock-solid defense behind it. Mike, defense is often the least considered aspect of baseball. Why is that? I think the reason that defense gets overlooked, maybe not overlooked, but not isn't as valued, I think, in the modern game as much is because it's easier to, to to project someone's defensive ability. That's one reason, I think, than it is their offensive ability. And then I think it's also because it's easier to find guys who can at least adequately play defense than it is guys who can adequately hit. 
you know, they say the hardest thing in the world is hitting a round ball with the round bat and all that sort of stuff. And I, to some extent, agree with that. But to find somebody who's a solid defender, I think is much easier. And I also think general consensus, or at least it used to be this way, I think this might be changing, is that it's easier to develop those skills than it is to develop some of the hitting skills, especially things like approach and stuff like that, because it can be a little bit harder to develop as we're now starting to see like things like bat speed can be developed and, and all that sort of stuff, power. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think defense is generally seen as easier to develop, easier to project and easier to find more guys who can do it adequately. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I think you're right. I think when I mean, you go out to a college baseball program, you'll find 10 guys who are great defenders and two guys who are great hitters. You know, it's, the, the numbers are just different there. You know, there are a lot of guys who can defend in a good, you know, at a major league level or above, there are not a lot of guys who can hit at that level. And so it's just one of those numbers things. But I also think that because defense is harder to quantify, like harder to know whether or not someone is doing it well in the sense of like numbers, like we can't put very good stats on defense. We still aren't that good at it. Like we, we have outs above average defensive run saves and things like that, but it's always been harder to really quantify the defense of an individual player. It's a little bit easier to quantify the defense of a whole team uh, but because we have difficulty quantifying the defense of an individual player, or it came later at the very least, it's harder to sort of say like that guy is valuable for that reason. You know what I'm saying? And so we have mm-hmm. vague things like Yadier Molina is a valuable player because he's a good catcher, you know, like, but you know, even that was really tough to quantify. And so, you know, one of those things I think makes D de- or that's one of the things that makes defense a lot more considered when we talk about baseball, nobody's out there saying, Oh, this guy has, you know, four ab- outs above average. Like that's not something we say in casual conversation. They'll say that guy's hitting 300 in casual conversation all the time. Yeah. And I think it, there's still an old way of thinking that very much creeps into discussions on defense where a guy will have a tool or two tools that play defensively, but they're slow you know, or they're not quick, which makes it the other tools almost irrelevant. And so we go, well, that guy's a great defender because he throws really well or because he's got really great hands at third. And you're like, but he can only get to balls that are hit right at him. (laughs) So like he's it's moot if you can't get to a ball that's not hit right at you. And so uh, I think that can be because I I go back to and, and this is not a knock on him because he was a very good third baseman, especially early in his career. But um Beltre, uh, what, Adrian Beltre, Adrian Beltre at third Hall base. Of Famer Adrian La- Beltre. Later in his career, people were talking about him like he was some phenomenal third baseman, and he couldn't move. And it's like, wait, he was a good third baseman ten years ago when he could move. He can't move now, so I don't care how great his hands are or his arm from third base. He doesn't move. It doesn't yeah, matter. This, <laughs> this is the Hunter Renfro problem right now. Yeah, I, like, yeah, I wasn't even thinking like, of Hunter Renfro, but I yes, keep, it's the exact I keep same getting thing. people online telling me that he's a great right fielder because he does a good job catching balls at the limits of his range, but his range is so limited that he's actually a negative when it comes to def- defensively. He has a good arm too, but uh, you know he's ultimately a negative. But uh, Mike, generally speaking, what can exceptional defense do for a team? What's it doing for the Royals right now, and what can it do if they're if a team is really good defensively? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that it can do, but I'm going to talk about one specific thing. It can change the complexion of a game, especially late in the game. And we saw that with the Kyle Isbell catch when, you know, that was the fifth or fourth inning, but everybody knew that was the end of the game, (laughs) like because of the weather, the game wasn't going on past that. So, yeah, it can really change. I mean, we saw it with uh, Adam Frazier the other day, robbing that home run. And it, it can be in the early innings, too. It can really just change the complexion of a game where you go, hey, we just got out of an inning because of this great defensive play. You go around and score inning or score some runs in that next half inning. The game is a different thing altogether. Even if you were getting your pitcher was getting pounded before that or whatever. So I like the ability of a great defensive play or a great double play or something like that to be able to change the complexity of a game. Yeah. And obviously overall run prevention is, is the purpose of defense. And that is one thing that it can, it can do, but in terms of roster building, it can change the type of pitchers that a team can make useful. And we're seeing that a ton with the Royals right now. So Seth Lugo becomes a much more valuable pitcher with a defense behind him. Like the Royals have right. John Schreiber becomes a much more valuable pitcher and Hill Zerpa becomes a much more valuable pitcher because of the types of defense. Brady Singer becomes a much more valuable pitcher because of the type of defense he has behind him. That means that you don't have to have, you don't have to be able to find the 
you know, eight or nine guys on planet earth who can strike out enough guys to make it <laughs> as a pitcher in major league baseball. You know, like it's so hard to find those guys. There just aren't that many of them. There are way more guys who can adequately not walk people, get enough strikeouts, but also put the ball on the ground or, you know, don't let the ball leave the park. Let your good defense in the outfield or the infield, you know, take care of you and that sort of thing. There are a lot more of those guys. It just makes it much more viable to put together an adequate pitching staff if you have that kind of defense. And let's be My, clear here. The Royals have a very good infield defense. They do. You know, that's Kyle Isbell makes, is a good center fielder. Melendez has improved and left. But their corner outfield defense is nothing more than if they're if on a good day average. And so that's really what it is. But they built their pitching staff around the idea that they would have a great infield defense, mm-hmm. which if you talk about roster construction, when you do that, you might be able to say, you know what? We don't probably need great corner outfield defense because we've got pitchers that throw ground, you know, throw a lot of ground balls and the guys who can field those ground balls. So we can afford to go get maybe a slugger or we can afford to put an MJ Melendez in the left while he works on improving that outfield instead of having to have great outfield defense because we got guys that strike people out. Well, when they don't strike people out. They're giving out deep fly balls into the gaps. Yeah, well, here's and this is why it all works together and also why, in my mind, defense isn't as talked about. Team defense makes a lot more sense than, you know, individual defense, I think, as a concept. Like, you can understand defense better if you think about how the team plays together. And so the Royals have an elite center fielder in Kyle Isbell. What does that mean? That means they don't need as good of players in the corners either, right? Like, And so MJ Melendez might be average. Hunter Renfro is slightly below average, but you don't need to be exceptional. And they rotate in guys like Adam Frazier, who's probably above average in right field because he has more range than your average right fielder. But you do that sort of thing. You put in Dyron Blanco, you sub those guys in. They know they can probably have an elite outfield defense if they want to. Their elite outfield defense version is probably Kyle Isbell in center, Dyron Blanco in left. Adam Frazier in right or Adam Frazier in left, Dyron Blanco in right or something like that. That's probably a close to elite outfield defense, but they know that if they have really good infield defense, a great center fielder, they can have average guys in the corner and be fine. Like that, that's, that's something and still have what is currently probably the best defense in major league baseball. Like we're talking about the Royals defense specifically. So do you have a sense of why they're so good? Why they're as good as they are? Real simple, young athletes. That's what they have. They have, and they've drafted and signed and traded for that style. It's been their thing for many years, even under Dayton Moore. That was a big part of their thing. They were always looking for up the middle athletes. And then those guys could be moved to other places. You know, when they went and even when a guy like MJ Melendez, who starts out as a catcher, well, when you draft him, you don't go, well, there's just some fat sloppy catcher, you know, no, he's a a good athlete too. If he catching doesn't work out, we can move him off to somewhere else. Like even, even I think Isbell didn't start playing. He was a center he was a until he baseman. was in college. Well, so, he was a second baseman for most of his college time. Like that's yeah, where I he think spent most of his time. Last year they moved him to center. So, or no, I think he had actually played center field early in his college career, played oh, second for most of his college career. And they moved him back to the outfield in the minor leagues. I think. Okay. That one. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like just athletes, you know, you draft a Bobby Witt jr. You sign a Michael Garcia. Those are both short stops right there. You know, Michael Massey was probably always a, a going to be a second baseman, but you're they when they go out and look for people, it was athlete, athleticism is something that they always look for, and that's always going to pay dividends when it comes to defense. And you can turn those guys into good defenders if they aren't. If they're just good athletes, you can turn them into good defenders if you have good infield coaching. And that's been a big part of why the defense has been successful. They transition uh, MJ Melendez from a catcher to a what seemingly looks like an average outfielder because he's athletic and because Damon Hollins did a good job helping him. Like that's, they have good. And Jose Aguasil needs a, a big credit and Paul Hoover as well. Those three, Jose Aguasil is their infield coach. Damon Hollins is their outfield coach and Paul Hoover is their catcher's coach. Those three have done an excellent job making the fielders for the Royals better. And we can talk about the specific examples. MJ Melendez and left has gotten significantly better. Vinny Pasquantino at first base has gotten significantly better. Michael Garcia had to move from short to third base and has made that transition pretty seamlessly. Jose Aguasil doing a great job there. Paul Hoover, I think Salvador Perez is having the best, maybe the best year of his life catching defensively this year. That's on, that's Paul Hoover. He deserves credit for that. So the idea of like drafting and signing athletes and then teaching them to play great defense 
seems to make a ton of sense. It's honestly a, a formula that works across multiple sports as they often do this with the Chiefs as well, right? Like draft great athletes defensively, teach them how to play cornerback, teach them how to do these things, right? Like that's a really good sort of philosophy for defense overall. Mike, is there any way in which this defense could actually improve at this point? Yeah, and actually you just mentioned some of the things I was going to talk about. Uh, the obvious answer is in right field, right? Because Hunter Renfro, for the for the skills that he has as an outfielder, arm, you know, he'll make the plays, the, the generic plays that are hit at him. He does not have the range to be an effective or even average right fielder anymore. Okay. That's just how it is. I'm sorry if that disappoints people, Father but we've time, seen that improvement undefeated <laughs> father time is undefeated. You are correct. But Salvi improving that framing has been a big step up for the Royals this year, helping the pitching staff in that regard. Maybe the biggest one is Vinny Pasquantino. And we really don't talk about it that much, but I heard a thing. He was leading the league in first baseman for outs above average, uh, like just a few days ago. I don't know if it's still the case or not, but that's that's very good because we always saw Vinny as a DH guy like, oh, he's a very average, you know, first baseman. And maybe that's all he still is. But if he's gone from average to above average, that's huge. That's that's if you do that with everybody, you've improved by you've won five more to 10 more games in that year because of that. Like, think about if Vinny Pasquantino's improved defense is worth one and a half wins this year. And you do that with five guys, you're talking 10 wins, okay? Close to 10 wins that you're accumulating there. Your math is there. awful. Uh, but you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's, it's, it's bad math. <laughs> one and a half listen. times. Kids, don't, don't, do, don't take math from Mike. He's one and a half teacher. times six is nine, right? One and a half times uh, five is what? Well, yeah, but Vinny's Seven the and a half. Oh, oh you're talking six. six. Okay, I see. Uh, Never mind. He's just a bad word problem Nine is writer, close to 10. So don't uh, listen to him either way. <laughs> I, I want to make this point about Vinny too, like – um and I, po I point this out on Twitter occasionally. We saw a, a Detroit, a number of their first basemen or their first basemen have trouble like throwing to a pitcher on the move to first. Yes. That is one of the mm -hmm. things that has impressed me so much about Vinny's game this he's year. Very he's very good at a, it. He's had a lot of opportunities to throw to first base to a pitcher covering from long distances this this year and he does it so well he leads them so well and so that's just an aspect of his game i greatly appreciate and i'm so glad that uh he's he's getting some more recognition for the defense because that was he does really good at that uh anyway i want to talk about what they can do to improve but honestly i think you're right there's not a ton that they could do to improve they could upgrade a little bit in right field if they want to. I don't know that that's worth it. I think they're going to think more about right field in terms of the offensive production that Hunter Renfro is giving. But it is interesting to me that you're seeing some of the decisions that they're making be driven entirely almost by how effective they are as a team defensively. And so, for example, Kyle Isbell continues to play despite the fact that he has like a 550 OPS. Why? Because he's an amazing defender and center, and they their whole plan is built around the notion that their pitching staff is going to keep them in games because they have great defense out there. They, they A lot of people are like, we need Drew Waters up here in center field. Drew Waters is not as good defensively as Kyle Isbell, and their team kind of relies on him being the linchpin defensively in the outfield. And so it's one of those things that they really are leaning into this defense, and it's paying big dividends at this point, because let's face it, they're five games above 500. Nobody thought they would be. The Royals continue their road trip by heading north of the border to face the Blue Jays, who they just took three of four from in Kansas City a week ago. I love this weird scheduling where they're like, they've done it like three times now, where they play a series against somebody at home, and then a week later, they're playing them on the road this year. So the Baltimore, White Sox, and now the Blue Jays, they've seen, they're going to see all of them like really quickly, uh, which is awesome. After that, they'll get a day off before starting a six-game homestand with a three-gamer against the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers. Mike, remind us what the Blue Jays are like because we don't remember what happened three days ago. <laughs> they are 13-16, and 16, which is good for fourth in the American League East. Uh, and again, I think I mentioned earlier, fantastic lineup. Some questions in the starting rotation have, have kind of cost them a little bit this year. First game is going to be uh, Jonathan Bolin. Exciting to make his, uh, not his major league debut. Cause I think he pitched like an inning or two innings last year, but, uh, Jonathan Bolin's going to get the start and that's exciting versus Yariel Rodriguez, 27 year old right-handed pitcher out of Cuba, a 3.86 ERA and a 1.54 whip. The ERA is a little deceptive. He's got a four seam fastball in the mid nineties, a slider, a splitter and a curveball. 
His expected ERA, though, is over five, slightly over five. We just saw him not that long ago, and we got uh, three earned runs and four innings pitched last week, a week ago. Yeah, so that was good. He's kind of a boomer bust guy. He's a strikeout guy, or he gets hit really, really hard. And so hopefully uh, Bolin can have a great debut, and Rodriguez also gets hit really hard. Second game will be a rematch of that rain-shortened game, Cole Reagans versus Jose Barrios, the 29-year-old right-handed pitcher out of Papa Juan, the 23rd high school in Puerto Rico. Second time I've said that in two weeks. <laughs> 1.23 ERA, 1.04 whip. Jose Barrios is just a the consummate pro. Sinker, 93 to 94. Slurve, four-seamer changeup. Mostly sinker slurve. In that game in Kansas City where it was pouring and cold, the fastball velocity was down a little bit. Uh, not sure if that was a weather thing or if Barrios is, is struggling to keep the velocity up on the sinker, but uh, he's he's been around for a while now with Minnesota and now the Jays, so he knows what he's doing. And that last game, it'll be uh, Lugo, who's been fantastic, versus Chris Bassett, 35-year-old righty out of Akron, 5.64 ERA and a 1.85 whip. Ugh, <laughs> that's pretty bad for Chris Bassett. Good sinker boy. in the low 90s, yeah. Cutter, curveball, uh, sweeper, slider, changeup, a lot of different pitches. Throws a ton of pitches, none that are a dominant pitch. Uh, the issues he's had this year have been walk-related. Uh, his walk rate is up to 12.1, and his hard hit rate is 42%, which is not good at all. And so hopefully that trend continues, and we can uh, score a few more runs for Lugo than what we've gotten for him in the past. Uh, he's been pitching really, really well, and then we wait till he leaves the game to score any runs. So... Uh, hopefully we can get some runs and then we'll go up against the Chris young led Texas former or defending champ, Texas Rangers. Yes. Uh, it is Chris young and Dayton Moore, I think leading up the Texas Rangers, basically, uh, no, he's, I think more just a consultant, but, uh, yeah, they come in 15 and 14 second in the AL West. So there's off to kind of a, an even 500 start, basically. Uh, their offense is 11th in weighted runs created plus in Major League Baseball, which is pretty good. Uh, they have, they're getting good seasons from Marcus Simeon, from Josh Smith, and from Adolis Garcia, so some of the guys you expect. But they are still waiting for Corey Seager to really break out. Uh, they have a good prospect named Wyatt Langford, who's, who's been with them all season, who looks like he just hit his first home to, run. Just his first home run. It was inside the Parker. Uh, so offense has some weapons, some definite uh, weapons. Let's hopefully we're catching them on a down week. They are missing Josh Young, who is out hurt, I believe. Yes, I think he had a broken wrist or something. He got I believe hit by so. A, I, I think, think he got hit wrist, by a pitch. So. Um, so, yes, they are missing him, but still plenty of talent in that lineup. Um, pitching, their pitching is 19th in Team R ERA. That's one of their weaknesses here. Uh, they're getting good seasons from Nathan Evaldi and John Gray, uh, but they are getting uh, an okay – they're also getting an okay season from Michael Lorenzen, who signed really late with them, like – maybe near the end of spring training, like really late Michael Lorenzen signed with them. He's doing all right about league average. Andrew Heaney, who was a big free agent sign for them a couple of years ago, has been atrocious, just really, really bad. And so hopefully we get Heaney and somebody else who's not doing very good. I think the, um, hasn't the, did the lighter kid make his debut? Uh, oh, he did make his, uh, his pitching debut, uh, Jack lighter. I don't know if he has since gone back down or if he's filling a rotation spot for them. Uh, still, I'm not sure. And so we'll see if Lighter to see him throw. Uh, throwing in Kansas City. Or, yes, that'll be in Kansas City. Defensively, since we're talking about defense this episode, they come in second right behind the Royals in defensive run saved. Though the Royals have 25 and they have 19. The Royals actually aren't just the best. They're actually quite a bit away ahead of the field uh, defensively, at least in the defensive run save metric. We'll end this week's episode like we end every episode with our Just a Bit Outside segment, where we talk about something that's interesting to us outside the world of baseball. I've done a much better job like writing these down when I think of them, and so I have like a lot to talk about, but... Uh, I was, so I'm happy. I'm making it less stressful in my just a bit outside segment this week. Mike, what interested you outside the world of baseball last week? Well, it was no, uh, nothing specific or anything like that. I just had this thought because I, I have a somewhat unique perspective on parenting because I'm a parent, but I'm also a teacher. So I, I am around children all the time. Right? That doesn't Different seem like groups. a unique perspective to me because there are a lot of teachers who have kids. Well, you know, maybe not so. unique, but it's it's a perspective that not everybody can share if you're not an educator or you don't work with children. Um, but I also I get to see a lot of parents in parenting roles and stuff, especially through coaching and things like that. But there's one thing I, I kind of want. I wish more parents did. OK, one is, is that you teach your children to try to include everyone. And I think actually 
parents are pretty good about this. And I know we do it a lot in the school system as well. Um, so I, I think that's kind of being covered. And, and it was, and th that's what brought this up. We did like a fun thing on Friday because it was the end of map testing and I teach eighth graders. So they never take the map test again. So we did a little uh, celebration thing. And I noticed during that there was a lot of children who were making an effort to include other children. And I thought that was great. You know, it's, it's really good to see the kids aren't as messed up as people think that they are in regards to those types of things anyway. Um, and, and that was cool to see. But the thing that kind of has gotten me over the last few years is this, and this is the second part of that. So teach your children to include everyone, but that it is okay for themselves not to be included all the time. Okay. And not in like a mean kind of way, you know, it, it's not nice to feel like somebody left you out intentionally, but I think sometimes we don't teach people that it's okay for other people to go do something and have their own thing, right? It's like, okay, my friend is going to do this with these other friends. Why wasn't I invited? Well, maybe, maybe the, it's a different dynamic or maybe they didn't think you were going to have fun or whatever. It's okay to not be included in every little thing. Okay. So I've gone, I go through this all the time in my job and it's that we'll, you know, even the thing where it's like, we'll do something as a group of teachers for our students and the, another group of teachers won't and parents will call the school. How come my child didn't get to do the same thing this other class was doing? Well, they're not in that class and, and it's okay. They do other things and that's fine. Be okay allowing your kid not to be involved in everything because that is okay. You're not in life going to be included in everything <laughs> and that should be okay. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to teach my son as, as he gets older is, you know, he sees some things right now that he wants to go do. And it's like, man, one, you're, maybe you're not old enough or you know, whatever, you have to be okay not being able to go do that stuff. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is sort of connected to the just epidemic that exists uh, in our society that is like uh, people putting the locus of their identity outside of them. So they take it like personally, they see it as like a personal comment on them if they're not included. And it's like, no, this might not be like a thing. This might not be about you. You know, this might just be like logistics didn't work out or, or whatever. You know, it's like, I find it odd sometimes when I hear people say like, I wasn't included and that hurt my feelings. And I get that to some degree. I get that. If, if you thought you were like personally not included for some reason or something like that. But at the same time, I think to myself, like, why would you take that personally? Like, I, I, I don't get that all the time. You know, sometimes it's just like you're, you're creating reasons why it happened when maybe it was an entirely different reason, right? Like, you know, why are you creating these narratives that are like, it's about who you are as a person? Like you're letting them define you. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. It's, it's, it's bad for us ultimately. You know? So I think that's a great advice. Like, uh, yeah. Tr train yourself to be okay. Not being included, but train your kids too. Um, I'm talking about another thing that was actually you brought up in me this week when you, uh, when the draft came around, the NFL draft came around this week. Uh, I had an idea. I was sitting there one day and I was like, Hey, everybody's talking about draft stuff. You know, sometimes people ask us for our chief's opinions, which is interesting because we actually might be more qualified to provide chief's opinions than we are to provide Royals opinions, but we still provide Royals opinions. I don't get it. Really. <laughs> Especially you. I'm probably more qualified to provide Royals opinions, but yeah. Um, but Mike is a football coach and has been at one of the most successful high school programs in this, in the state and all this sort of stuff. Um, and so I was sitting there thinking, I don't know anything about the draft. My whole timeline is draft stuff. I'm like, but Mike knows draft stuff. And so I was like, Mike, write us a, a, a Substack post about the, to, like, I should have an opinion about something I haven't like studied on. Like this year, I didn't read anything about the draft going into it. Right. And so my, my just a bit outside for this week is it's okay to not have or share an opinion on something when you haven't done the requisite work to have a good opinion on it. Like, I know this is the internet age and this is a foolish thing to say because in the internet age, it's have opinion, no matter what, how educated you are on the subject. But I'm of the mind that it's okay to not have or share an opinion on something when you know nothing about it and you haven't done the requisite work to educate yourself on it. I didn't do that with the draft this year. So when Mike and I talk about the draft, all I did was ask him questions about it. All I did was like, who do you like? I don't know. I haven't I think, looked at anybody. I think I got two guys right. I think they drafted oh, nice. two of the guys in our mock draft. If I'm not, if nice. I keep, if I'm just, just remembering on the top of my head, I think Jared oh. Wiley and Hunter Norzad were, were both guys that I put in there. Another reason to go ahead and subscribe to our Substack five dollars a month. Go read Mike's uh, go read Mike's draft stuff. Um, but this also came up again when uh, I got into a, a back and forth with David Lesky on Twitter when he was like trying to sort of like 
you know, speak back to somebody who was having an opinion when they didn't actually know that much about what was taking place. And it happens all the time. Like you and I pay more attention to the Royals than 99% of people in the world, which is good, probably a good thing, right? Like, um, <laughs> but it's okay if you just don't know that much about something to not make claims about it, to not pretend that you do. Just ask questions. You'll learn more about it. It'll be great. But I want us to sort of get to a place where we're actually teaching people it's okay if you just don't have an opinion. It is okay if you just have no opinion because you haven't read enough about it or learned enough about it or anything like that. It's totally okay to just or not have Or you're just an not interested it. in it. That's fine that's too. That's okay too. Like, <laughs> that's fine too. Like if you're not interested in it, that's fine. But don't pretend like, oh, I'm now in a context where people are having opinions about it. I got to have one too. It's like, yeah. no, you don't. You that's look ridiculous. Okay. To anybody who knows what they're talking about, you look ridiculous. And two, you are actually poisoning the discourse because your take is going to be the most simplified, reductive take there is. And that explains the internet, right? That just explains the internet. Right? <laughs> and so, no, you don't know as much about a doctor as, you know, vaccinations or, you know, elbow injuries or whatever. You don't know as much, much about somebody who has been educating themselves for many, many years on a subject. It's okay to just say, I don't know. That's totally fine. Yeah. And that's why... Mark and I have a very good friend named Matt and have, he's been our friend for many, many 30 plus years. And that's what I love about him. He will never go out and say, Oh, this is my thing. Cause I, he will never give an opinion on anything he doesn't know. So he famously hates and is not interested at all in politics. So if you talk to him, anything about politics, he'll literally just sit there and stare at you because mm -hmm. he, he doesn't care to give an opinion. He has no, no knowledge about it. Cause he does not care. He doesn't, he's a smart guy. He could go learn about it, but he literally doesn't care. And so he just doesn't talk about it. He talks about the things he is knowledgeable on, of which there are many. But uh, yeah, he he's he just refuses to offer offer up opinions on anything he doesn't uh, doesn't know anything about. <laughs> yes, not to be fair to him, he is in a privileged position, so he doesn't need to care that much about That's politics true. right yeah. now. <laughs> Might change in the future. Who knows? But he is the type of person who just has an ethos. It's not just about politics. There are other things he knows absolutely nothing about, and he just doesn't. He'll, he'll admit it. I don't know anything about that. He'll ask questions about it sometimes, but he won't ever be like, I know about this thing. Listen to me about this thing. It's not really his thing. Love people who have that disposition, have that disposition. It's a great thing to have. Also, another great thing to have a subscription to the Royals Weekly Substack and a, a disposition that says, I'm going to listen every, every week. So come back next week when we talk about the Royals again. Until then, be good to each other and go Royals.